Welcome to The Breakfast. It's time for Off the Press. I start off with the Punch newspaper this morning. Now looking at the front page of the Punch newspaper, INEC awaits Buhari's nod on e-transmission of result. Now that's quite interesting. It's been making uh, the rounds uh, since yesterday. INEC awaits Buhari's nod on e-transmission of result. Uh, you've got several riders underneath the board caption. Existing law stipulates manual collision. Existing law stipulates manual collision. Amendment requires Buhari's assent. That's what INEC is saying. Direct primaries will end Godfadarism, says House of Representatives Chairman. And you also have another rider reading. APC-led National Assembly has subjected wishes of Nigerians to money bags, alleges the PDP. Uh, that's all on page two of the Punch newspaper. I mean, if you flip through the pages. You also have another caption here, quite interesting. Eight month fuel import gulps, 690 million amid forex scarcity. Uh, that's uh, what you have. All right, let's move away from the Punch and see what we can find on the daily independent newspapers. It says, yes, Senate gets kudos over U turn on e transmission of results. Attracts thumbs down on direct primaries for political parties. Experts say e uh, Naira devaluation will push inflation to 25%. The vice president says here, I didn't advocate Naira devaluation. Reps OK creation of Southwest and Southeast Development Commissions. And also, our reforms have stabilized banks, says the CBN governor. Bandits attack Catholic Church in Kaduna, abduct three students. And gunmen invade Abgar rally in Anambra. Obiano escapes unhurt. Police recover AK-47 rifle, ammunition, and four vehicles. Those are the stories that we can find. Uh, very few of them on the daily independent newspapers this morning. All right, let's move on to the nation newspaper this morning. Looking at the front page, uh, the bold caption reads, Senate, we bow to public on e-transmission of results. Uh, that's what's boldly written. You also have WK. Equiramadu, Lord Decision. Uh, you also have another writer reading, INEC, we will wait for President's assent. It's uh, underneath the board caption on the Nation newspaper. Reps OK Southwest Development Commission. That's also another one on page six. And Custom Duties 91 Private Jets Rigs for Feature. Uh, that's also on page five, Agency Class 57. Okay, quickly, just before we move away from uh, the, the Nation newspaper this morning, uh, you have this caption saying, soldiers short, many injured in Abgar rally shooting. Uh, that's it on page three. I think it was one of the things, um, okay, I think that was in Anambra. There was also an attack on um, uh, one of the things that I shared on Daily, Daily Independent, and a uh, gunman invading an Abgar rally in Anambra. Well, let's move now to the Daily Trust newspapers. Big one there says, uh, despite bead disqualification, federal government moves to award Intel's multi-billion Naira boat service contract. It says also, BPP NPA kick as the company demands 25 years and 25% commission. President passes buck, uh, ministry mom. Sad one, it says here, 1,153 civilians 176 security personnel killed in three months. And also Nigerian Railway, a moribund sector roars. Insecurity, 62 private jet owners shun customs verification. And abducted Kebi uh, students freed over, or rather after over 100 days in captivity. Those are the big ones on the Daily Trust newspapers this morning. Uh, we'll say good morning to our guest, uh, Mr. Femi Lawson. Thanks for joining us. All right, let's start with the big one on the Daily Trust newspapers this morning on one of the stories there that says 1,153 civilians, 176 security personnel killed in three months here in Nigeria. 
Uh, let's get your thoughts on that one. In, you would only see these figures in a, in a country that is at a, a full-blown war, I believe. Um, but what exactly is going on in Nigeria? The truth, the truth like, uh, whether anybody likes it or not, the country seems to be at war with itself. Because not even, you know, during the Civil War, if we record this number of people being killed within just 90 days, between July and September, just like you said, we've lost over 1,000 Nigerians. We've lost 176 security personnel. In just 90 days, just three months, it tells you that something is very, very wrong. The truth is that even for societies that are fighting you know, physical war, would not have imagined that 1,000 of your citizens would get killed in just 90 days. But unfortunately, we keep moving on. I think nothing is actually wrong. It is frightening that life has become so brutish that it does not really make me need to the Nigerian state any longer. That in 90 days, over 1,000 citizens you know, have been killed, and the, the country seems to be moving on like nothing is really happening. It is, it is, it is alarming. And, and if you also notice on the Daily Post, it, it says the abducted Kebi students freed after over 100 days in captivity. I'm very sure that, you know, a lot of Nigerians even forgot that there were students in captivity, you know, from Kebi State um, in the past 100 days. And, and, and that's also, you know, including the Nigerian government, who basically left, I believe, a, um, students in captivity for 100 days. Hmm. It, 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 it's sad. It's sad because we were hurt here in 2014 when uh, the unfortunate incident in Chibok happened, when school girls were abducted. But today, the manner of silence that has greeted the abduction of the Kebi students. Not only that, we remember the Peter Baptist, you know, students in Kaduna. Remember those children who were also kidnapped in Niger State. Our government seems to keep moving on. Our, even those who were vocal in 2014 when Chibok happened, you know, became suddenly silent. Except for the media. Media organizations like yours and the few persons within the civil society who have continued to demand the release of these abducted children. Nothing seems to be happening. The government, even you could hear parents of these you know, children accusing government of abandoning them to their faith. So we should be glad that uh, you know these children are being released, but we should also be worried that the whole number of our children can be adopted and the state keep acting as if, you know, nothing, has, nothing really is, is wrong. It is worrisome. It is really worrisome. But we, we should be glad that at least these children are being freed. And remember that why these children are being freed, that some others are being abducted, you know, like the report we received, you know, from Cardinal yesterday. So I think... Uh, it, 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 it's really cause for serious concern. Okay. Uh, but if you also remember the, um, when all of this, when all of these issues, when all of these issues actually started, I mean, there was an introduction of the Safe School Initiative Program to ensure that there is perimeter fencing. I mean, the school is actually protected. All of the schools, especially in the northern region, has got all of this protection to um, ensure that that doesn't, there's no repetition of all of these kidnaps. The Safe School Initiative program that was introduced, I mean, shortly after the Boko Haram, uh, the Chibok students were kidnapped. So um, what do you really make of this? Because it, it's not about the fact that this has been occurring over and over again, and this program was introduced to ensure that that does not uh, repeat itself and that students are protected in this particular region. But with the Safe School Initiative program, uh, nothing seemed to have changed. Is it nothing has changed because 
These policies are mere policies that are formulated in Abuja and do, does not exceed, you know, the, the, the desk of the policy makers whenever these policies are made. The truth is that for all the recorded incidences, you know, of school kidnap, attacks on schools that have been witnessed over the last couple of years, has there been any resistance? Has there been any time that, you know, we have reports of, you know, one school not being successfully invaded when these attempts are made? The school safety in initiative was a mere, you know, so declaration a mere former policy of government that has never been followed up, followed up rather, with any practical you know step. Today you can have and uh, you can have from people from all over the country if there is actually any school anywhere apart from the private institution that enjoys special security coverage or have dedicated the security network, the way the country protects pipeline, the way the country protects, you know, critical infrastructures. None. So the schools have been left to their fate. The school children have been left to their fate. And it's very unfortunate that the school, you know, the, the initiative was merely you know, a declaration that has not been followed up with any practical, you know, you know enforcement. Okay, so uh, let's look at the Punch newspaper now. Uh, one of the big stories saying that INEC awaits Buhari's nod on e-transmission of results. Uh, a lot of Nigerians are quite excited with the fact that, yes, uh, you know, the lawmakers have actually uh, yielded to the cry of the public and are saying, okay, yes, now we're handing over uh, powers. We're saying that INEC should be able to decide whether or not they are going to transmit uh, the result electronically. Uh, what do you make of this first of all? Well, uh, it is uh, one thing that uh, the Senate finally is coming to an agreement that uh, the INEC can actually go ahead and conduct, um, conduct electronic transmission of results you know, during elections. But we have insisted that it is not in the first place even within the power of INEC, to determine how INEC will conduct its election. Because the Constitution has given INEC the power to determine the mode you know, of election, how it conducts its elections in Nigeria. What the National Assembly was attempting to do before was to interfere in a process that it does not have any role to play in. It was only trying to smuggle itself in as an umpire in the electoral process, but we are glad that reasoning has been allowed to prevail because the introduction of results is one you know, process that has enjoyed the support of the majority of Nigerians, going by the reactions that trailed you know, the earlier rejection you know, of the electoral transition of results. By, by, by the House of Reps and the, you know, by the National Assembly of the Police. So I think it's a good one. Yeah, so finally so why then are they waiting for a nod from the president? I don't think there should be any debate further on this, other than you know, the president himself also emphasizing the fact that it is within the power of INEC you know, to conduct elections the way it may desire as empowered by the Constitution. Yeah, but Mr. Lawson, why then is INEC saying they're waiting for a go-ahead from President Mohamedou Buhari? Come again, please. I'm asking, why then is INEC saying that they're waiting for a go-ahead from the President? Well, INEC, INEC itself, you know, must uh, understand that uh, it is an establishment of the law, and the powers are clearly stated in the law. So waiting for the President's nod, on e transmission does not sound properly correct, and I don't really want to even agree with that headline when I read it because I would not want to imagine when it becomes you know the power of the president to decide how elections are conducted, especially even if it's an election that the president himself may likely be participating in. 
So I don't completely want to agree with that headline that uh, says we make a wait by Buhari's Lodge on the intersection of results. If the amendment has been done on the Electoral Act, of course, it's inevitable for the president to ascend the Electoral you know, Act when amended. But I don't think it is basically because the president will have to give go ahead or not on the intersection of results. I don't want to think that All is right. correct. Well, Femi Lawson, let, let's move over to something on the Daily Independent. It says, Reps, OK, creation of Southwest and Southeast um, Development Commissions. Um, you know, quickly share your thoughts on that one. I, I, of course, we're aware that there's a Niger Delta Development Commission. There's also one in the north. Um, mm -hmm. Does it seem OK that we are spreading development commissions across different regions in the country? Mm, you see, we'll continue to create, after the creation of a... Start with the uh, Development Commission. We we'll wake up tomorrow again, you know, for similar demand, maybe from the North Central. Already we have the North Chief Development Commission. And uh, you come to ask yourself why we keep, you know, recognizing the entity that we claim to be united. It tells you that all is not well when each region of the country continues to think there's a need, you know, for special attention to their region. The truth is that what has the North, you know, East Development Commission been able to do as far as addressing the issue of the crisis in the Northeast region of the country today is concerned, other than the fact that it has become, you know, another of the multiple contract awarding, you know, establishment created by the government to make very few Nigerians become you know, sudden you know, an emergency you know, millionaires and billionaires. But the real essence of facing this commission is you know, it's, it's not been met. And I don't think, rather than creating you know, development commissions and all these you know, funny bodies that the rep are moving to create uh, you know, again, we should be moving towards a proper restructuring of the country in order to make this region and our state work the way they should. No number of you know, establishments like uh, NDDC, NEDC, Southwest DC, or whatever you call it, can address the fundamental issues that have made our regions, our states, not to be efficient until we properly address the, the, you know, the problem itself. And that is very simple. When you restructure the country and the, you know, the regions become empowered, the state become empowered, and I don't think there'll be any need for this kind of agitation that are only meant you know, to create you know, some unnecessary commissions to begin to raise a new set of you know, millionaires among the political class. I don't think uh, it's, a, it's a, I don't think it's a necessary move. Okay, so uh, let's also look at the Nation newspaper this morning. Another big story here says, Custom duties, 91 private jets rigs for feature uh, for a country that uh, it's been reported that uh, we're topping uh, three, were well, number three, I mean, on that board for those who own private jets. Uh, 91 uh, private jets might just, uh, those who own them, might just rigs uh, losing them. Uh, what do you make of this headline? Well, it's a, it's a duty of, of the customs to evaluate you know, and of course, when necessary, you know, prescribe duties for get people or whatever it's called that are imported to the country. And if you understand, if you understand the fact that most of these private debts are owned by people so close to power, a lot of them do not only evade duty payment on their private debt, a lot of them also evade duty payment on the production of vehicles and other, you know, goods into the country because of their access, you know, to power and those in authority. If the custom has genuinely found out that people are evading the payment of duty or, or that declaring the worth, you know, of these vehicles, these aircraft that are being brought into the country, it is within the power of the custom to make the necessary sanctions available and get those who have violated, you know, the custom and excise law paid. 
or get the aircraft impounded. So that is that is a, a straightforward thing, and I don't think any political interpretation should be attached to that. All right. Um, there's also something on Daily Independent this morning talking about devaluation of the Naira. Um, it says there, experts say Naira devaluation will push inflation uh, to 25%. And of course, the vice president is also speaking, saying he did not advocate for further devaluation. We, 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 sh we should be worried. We should be worried that inflation isn't predicted, you know, to rise as much as 25%. Even at some, whether you like it on some goods or services, Inflation is at, it's already at that point. But I think by now, the economic team of the federal government should have been seen to be engaged in seek an emergency you know, measures to address this you know, unprecedented manner that uh, our currency is falling and the uh, inflation it's affecting virtually all goods and services in the country. It comes for a national emergency, but it seems that nobody's actually doing anything apart from the, the few policies that we are witnessing the central bank, you know, embarking upon. But where we are now is beyond what can be left for the central bank alone to address. The entire economic, you know, policy team of the government, you know, stakeholders within the sector must be brought together at this time to, you know, find a way out of this. It is no longer a time for rhetoric. It is no longer a time for assumptions. It is a time for practical steps to be taken. And if we don't do this, we are pushing our people to the point where, you know, our currencies become so even useless for daily, you know, to address daily needs. And that, that may spell, you know, a serious crisis for the country. So I think a national emergency has to be, you know, declared on this and something drastic has to be done. Okay. I also want you to speak on something on the punch. It's on the bottom left uh, corner of the punch, and that's with regards to the NSARS. I spoke about it yesterday briefly. It says the NSARS, Lagos loses 9.7 billion naira to uh, toll gates closure as it plans reopening of the toll gate. So I, I want you to get your thoughts on, on that. And of course, if you've noticed, and well, if you've you know, um, heard about the toll gate lately, you must see that there is some, uh, has been some police presence in the last few days at the uh, to, uh, uh, toll gate. Um, maybe expecting another protest, maybe expecting that um, there might be people gathered there to um, do a memorial of the NSAS protest one year after the NSAS protest began. So I want you to get share your thoughts on you know the drama concerning the toll gates and um, you know the the loss that the Lagos state government has also incurred. Well, as much as the state government or whoever is trying to remind us of how much has been lost to the closure of the Lekki toll gate, I think it's also important that they keep reminding Nigerians of the value of the lives of the innocent Nigerians that were murdered at that toll gate you know, by agents of the government. It is not enough to attach a value to the monetary losses being recorded you know, at the toll gate just because you cannot collect those from vehicles. Have they been able to value the life of those innocent Nigerians, those young Nigerians that were murdered in their cold blood at the toll gate? Have justice been served on those victims? Have they been able to bring perpetrators of those heinous killings to book one year after? These are the issues. It is insulting when you find government so particular about making money, making money, making money, not minding what becomes the face of the citizens that is claimed to be governing. The Nigerian state, you know, have questions to answer about the killings in Lucky. The state government and various states have to the panels, to the panels of inquiry, and they are yet to turn in their report, including Lagos State, where the report is expected today. So why is the state so unsure of reopening toll gates or telling us how much it has lost, when it has not actually told us the value of lives that were lost, the future governors, future ministers, future presidents, 
that were killed at Lake Itoge. I think we have to be sensitive to some of these issues. And, you know, taking one million mobile policemen or soldiers to Lekki would not stop you know, Nigeria from peacefully, you know, remembering those who were killed callously on October 20 last year. It's a civil protest. People have rights. And the law has said it at whatever time to peacefully protest and express themselves. You cannot begin to roll out tanks as if we are in a military state, like the Labour State Government and the police are currently doing. It is going to be resistant. All right. Uh, Femi Lawson, thank you very much, as always, for joining us and for sharing your views. And I hope that these conversations will always uh, come up and we'll get you to also share your thoughts on them uh, as quickly as possible. Good morning once again. All right, seems we have lost them. Um, and that's all we have for you today on Off the Press. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll tell you a little bit of what uh, happened today in history. And we're going to Chile uh, to share with you about how some people were rescued after close to 100 days on the ground. And then right after that, our first major conversation for today comes up. Good morning once again.